Hi, all of you everywhere around the world. Thank you so much for your good help. We broke through 185,000 subscribers. And I hope some of you have your dear, dear, dear cats, dogs, pets in your lap as we are heading into who knows what kind of fall and winter on this planet. But a week ago, on Thursday, September 23rd, 2021, the U.S. House of Representatives passed its proposed fiscal 2022 National Defense Authorization Act that includes a provision to organize a permanent office under the Secretary of Defense to investigate UFOs, also called Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, or UAPs. If the National Defense Authorization Act passes, a new and permanent UFO UAP office in the Pentagon would replace the recently formed Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, or UAPTF, that was involved in the 180-day countdown that did not deliver the long overdue headline that we are not alone in this universe. The newly proposed permanent UFO office would be tasked to coordinate and standardize UFO UAP data collection so that it could be cross-referenced throughout several federal departments and international allies to search for patterns and details in UFO reports that would help officials determine where UFO UAPs come from and whether they are a threat to Earth life. This is also a different proposed NDAA by the Senate Armed Services Committee that does not include any mandate for a permanent UFO UAP agency within the Department of Defense. But whichever National Defense Authorization Act prevails, it is fair to say that the United States government is finally seeming to acknowledge publicly that there is serious concern about the sources and agendas of UFO, UAP, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. The raw truth is UFOs and ETs are the big, big secret the government has tried to cover up since World War II. And all the UFO interferences with our American Minuteman missile sites, plus military whistleblowers who say the intelligences behind the UFOs are many and varied from friendly to neutral to hostile. And some have warned that when the United States split the atom and created the atomic bombs that ended the war with Japan, those explosions were tearing into other dimensions of other beings that we humans know nothing about. So using or testing atomic and hydrogen bombs had to be stopped by the extraterrestrial biological entities controlling UFOs, according to some whistleblowers. Homo sapiens sapiens' first test of an atomic bomb goes back to 1945. That's when the United States Manhattan Project in Los Alamos tried out a plutonium atomic bomb on July 16, 1945, at the Trinity site on New Mexico's White Sands Proving Ground. Three weeks later, on August 6, 1945, the United States dropped another atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. That bomb immediately killed an estimated 80,000 people and lots of animals and plants. Three days after that, on August 9, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Nagasaki, instantly killing an estimated 40,000 more people and lots more animals and plants. Those two atomic bombs ended the United States war with Japan after its attack in December 1941 on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And then, two years after that, in early July 1947, back at the White Sands Proving Ground region near Roswell, New Mexico, the commanding officer of the Roswell Army Airfield, Colonel William Blanchard, 
released teletype news to the local media that a silver disc had crashed near Roswell. This July 8, 1947 headline in the Roswell Daily Record went around the world. Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. Nuclear physicist and UFO investigator Stanton Friedman told me back in the 1980s that he had information going back to the late 1940s that White Sands Proving Ground was using strong microwave frequencies to try to deliberately interfere with UFOs, and those microwaves might be what caused several of the UFO crashes in southern New Mexico. And it was only a decade after that, on June 6, 1957, the United States tested its first intercontinental ballistic missile, the SM-65 Atlas B. And then, in the decades from 1957 to the 1980s, armed Minuteman nuclear missiles were 60 feet underground, ready to launch from ranges at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana, F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming, northeastern Colorado and southwestern Nebraska, Minot Air Force Base in Minot, North Dakota, Ellsworth Air Force Base in Newell and Rapid City, South Dakota, and Whiteman Air Force Base in Jefferson City, Missouri. Eventually, many of those missile fields were deactivated or de decommissioned, but there are still 400 Minuteman III nuclear missiles operational at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, and F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming. What most Americans did not know during the 1960s and the 1970s was that UFO UAPs were frequently intruding in those Minuteman nuclear missile fields in dramatic ways. It was in the early 1990s that I learned firsthand from a Boeing engineer that, quote, this is from my own file, it was impossible for those 10 missiles that we built to go offline one by one every second like they did. Impossible. But it happened, and the cause was apparently a UFO that we don't understand and we cannot control, close quote. Last week, I was talking with retired U.S. Air Force Minuteman Missile Launch Control Officer Robert Salas about all the military eyewitness testimonies of UFOs interfering with our Minuteman nuclear missiles since the 1960s, including his own experience at Malmstrom, and how so many people, including Congress, do not know the hard facts of very advanced intelligences interacting with complete control over our most sensitive, dangerous weapons. Bob Salas pointed out that the phony Condon Committee report that closed down Project Blue Book in December of 1969 did not even mention the dramatic UFO interferences with Minuteman nuclear missiles only two years before, on March, March 16th, and March 24th, 1967, at Malmstrom Air Force Base. The one on March 16th, 1967, involved a UFO that was hovering over the Echo Flight missile range when 10 missiles powered down one every second over 10 seconds. And then, only one week later, on March 24th, 1967, Robert Salas, a Minuteman One launch officer at Malmstrom Air Force Base's Oscar flight, was 60 feet underground in Launch Control's silo headquarters when an above-ground security guard called him to say that a large, red, glowing UFO was hovering over the Launch Control facility's security gate. And suddenly, 10 missiles dropped off alert status then one by one every second, just like what happened at Echo Flight only one week before. 
In 2005, Bob released the definitive book about those UFO and nuke incidents entitled Faded Giant with co-writer James Klotz. Bob also released another book in 2014 entitled Unidentified, the UFO Phenomenon, How World Governments Have Conspired to Conceal Humanity's Biggest Secret. Bob told me last week that is why he has been organizing a press conference for October 19th about nukes and UFOs at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. at 529 14th Street. Bob also has a GoFundMe page at his Facebook to help with airline tickets and hotels for the witnesses who will join him at the press club. Please go to Robert Salas 1 at Bob Salas's Facebook site for information to attend. And tonight, Ian is placing the Robert Salas link in our Earth Files broadcast information and comments. Bob's goal beyond the press conference will be to follow up with discussions in Washington with senators and representatives about scheduling congressional hearings to gather firsthand serious evidentiary information from military eyewitnesses about the many UFO interactions with Minuteman missiles since the 1960s. One retired U.S. Air Force security policeman that I know, who was an air base ground defense specialist on nuclear weapons, has some work commitments that prevent him from attending the October 19th press conference at the National Press Club that Bob Salas is organizing. So he is joining us tonight on this Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast. He is Mario Anthony Woods, Jr., 22 years old in this 1977 photo during his U.S. Air Force work. Mario is now 66 years old, but 44 years ago, in November of 1977, he was a senior airman security specialist and policeman in nuclear weapons who witnessed dramatic UFO activity over Ellsworth Air Force Base, a whole decade after Robert Salas's March 24, 1967 experience at Oscar Flight, when 10 nukes powered down every second for 10 seconds. That was at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Gray Falls. And then at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, in November 1977, he was on a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. night shift. And that's when Senior Airman Woods was staring at the clear sky around 9.30 p.m. when he saw a light flashing in that dark sky. I see this object that's about a 30-degree incline over the horizon, and I thought, what's that? That doesn't look like any star I've seen. And it fluctuated, and it was a little different tint to any light that I'd ever seen. Watched it for a while, and it really didn't move, but the light glimmered. So I just walked inside and flipped the facility lights, which I think there was about 12 or 14 big canned facility lights on all corners of the building and two on the fence lines, and it was all operated by one switch in the flight security controller's office. Pretty sure it was Bill Holloman, flight security controller on duty at the time. And I walked in. I said, hey, Bill, come check this out. But he was on the phone talking to his wife. He just kind of waved me off. So I just did what I wanted to do and flipped the light six or eight times. <laughs> well, in other yeah. words, you were thinking it some kind of joke, and you are flipping the lights to reply to whatever the blinking lights are. Yeah. My thinking was, you know, like ships at sea, that prairie there's nothing else out there north of Google, South Dakota. So I just flipped the light six or eight times and walked back out there. And the light flipped a little bit, you know. I mean, it was it changed its intensity, and all of a sudden, the damn thing went out. And I just stood there. I went, what the hell, you know. And all of a sudden, it came back on. It just flipped back on, just like it flipped off and flipped back on. And I went, well, that's weird. I said, let's have some fun with this. So I walked back into the office. And I said, man, you got to come check this house. Damn things flip the light off at me. And I flipped my lights again six or eight times. Same sequence. Walked outside, and it was off. 
Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, at about the same degree elevation, 30 degrees on the horizon, it was more north. When I came back outside, it was gone or it was off. And then all of a sudden, at about the 1 o'clock position, boom, it just beamed back on. And I go, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's moving. Yeah, it moved. It just moved in darkness. They imitate planets. And that's what it was doing. And I just happened to see it. So I go inside and I said, Michael. And I barely knew the guy's name. It was the first time we worked together. Michael Johnson. He outranked me. Anyway, I said, man, you got to come check this out. What? What? He was watching some TV, one of three channels. So I went back outside. He didn't come out for a few minutes, and I'm out there watching this thing. And it went off again for about a minute or two. And I'm just really perplexed and kind of laughing to myself. I said, it's got to be helicopters. But I've never seen anything that bright do that kind of thing. The intensity of it was just different, different light than I can even explain. What color would you say the light was? It had a red, white, orange tint to it. So anyway, it pops back on. Michael Johnson comes out, and I said, hey, check that thing out, man. I said, I flipped the lights at it. It started out over here, then it went out, and I flipped the lights at it again. It went out, and then it reappeared over here about 3 o'clock to about the 1 o'clock position. He just looked at me like I was a fool. He was a Chicago boy. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. And I'm a Southern boy. And lo and behold, the damn thing went out. And he just said something like, whatever, man. And he walked back inside. And this started at about 9.30. It had gone off and on twice, at least, maybe the third time. And I flipped the lights at it about four times. As I'm standing there, it goes off. He goes back in, and I waited, and I waited, and nothing happened. And it's about 10.15 now. And went back in, and I think I picked up a book, and I started watching some TV, you know, or something. I guess it was about 12.15, 12.20. And all of a sudden, the MCC phone went off, and the phone, when it rang at the flight security controller's office, it was a direct line. So what it did is it went, <clears throat> until you picked it up. There was no ringing or anything like that. That's what it did. So the bottleman picked it up and said, yes, sir. He says, yeah, we've got a SIT-4 at November 5. Well, a SIT-4 is a pretty serious alarm, and you don't have them very often. What that is is an inner zone penetration of the alarm system which are the three antenna array that's around and on top of the site. And then the C plug is the inner zone alarm on a SIT-4. Does SIT-4 stand for situation? That is correct. It stands for situation four. You are northwest of Rapid City by about how far? 55 miles. There were these crews down below yes. in the missile yes. silos, and you get a call from who? It was the commander of the launch control facility, and he's underground directly (laughs) under our feet at the launch control facility, which would have been November 1, as all of the LCS launch control facilities, which there was 15 of them at Ellsworth, all surrounding areas from the Badlands all the way north to Spearfish and Sturgis, South Dakota. So there was 150 missiles total, all spread out in all different areas, the flight security controller, who picked the phone up as it was buzzing directly behind him, relayed that there was a SIT-4 in progress, and it was at November 5, which happened to be the closest nuclear weapons silo closest to the November 1 launch facility. Which is where you were. Correct. And when you heard this information, did you think, this has something to do with that light that's been going on and off that I've been blinking at? I didn't at that point. Well, damn, a SIT-4, and we hadn't been here but 12 hours. And our first alarm is a SIT-4, which was pretty unusual. Usually didn't happen. I guess as the crow flies, November 5 is only about 7 to 8 miles directly away from the missile site. But, of course, we had to proceed down these clay roads, which are almost state highways in the Dakotas that are maintained extremely well. We proceeded toward Highway 79. A lot of the highways were built up high for the runoff of water and snow in the wintertime. And as we approached Highway 79, it was up higher than the clay road we were coming off of. And as I looked over to my right, as I'm the passenger in the vehicle, I'm looking out the window. And I looked to my right at about the 4 o'clock position as we were coming up to Highway 79, and I see this real bright glow from real low on the horizon over by November 5. So that would have been, you know, seven to eight miles that I was seeing this glow, kind of like when you approach a large city at night right. and you see the glow from the city. It was like that. And I looked at Michael Johnson. I said, hey, man, 
I said, I think that object is over there at November 5. I said, I'm telling you, look at that. Where else have you seen light in Newell, South Dakota like that? You know, because at 6 o'clock, they roll the sidewalks up. Literally, there's one stop sign and one stop light on Highway 79 in Newell, South Dakota. That's it. So the next city south is Sturgis. As we get on 79, now it's moved from that 4 o'clock position. As we're going dead south, now it's at the 2 o'clock position. And as we go downhill toward Newell, which is about 7 or 8 miles to the stop sign, it's Orman Road, O-R-M-A-N, and we turn right at the stop sign. You know, I kept waiting to see it. I was, I was kind of excited and scared at the same time. We go down about a mile, a mile and a quarter, and then that hardtop road drops back off on the clay, and it dog legs over to the left. And, Linda, when we rounded that corner, this object was sitting on top of November 5. It looked like a mini sun. And, honestly, the size of this thing was the only comparison that I've said to people was the size of a super Walmart center sitting 10 feet above the ground right on top of November 5. And it was so bright, it was as if it was a sun sitting there. Did it have color? Yes, it was red, orange, and white. There were no hard edges. There were no surface features that I could see. There were no wings. There was no portals, no areas for propulsion. There was nothing like that whatsoever. We rolled up to the cattle gate, which is built in the ground, not a gate you had to open. And we stopped there at a 45-degree angle like we were going to do something. What could we do, literally? We sat right at the end of that cattle gate road in a tactical position, both frozen in what we were doing. We just couldn't move. I mean, the light got so bright, I could almost see through my hands it was so bright. I had to close my eyes because the dashboard, everything in that vehicle was lit up, just like that movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when that mailbox scene. Right. It was like that. And then the atmosphere started evacuating after. The light never stopped, but all of a sudden we couldn't breathe. And it was as if somebody sucked all the air out of the area or out of the cab of that truck. I've never experienced anything like it. The only thing that I could do to get relief, and I knew I had to ask, was I rolled down that passenger window of that F-154 pickup truck, dark blue, U.S. Air Force Security Police on the side of it in letters, we had those stainless steel Western-style large mirrors on the side of our truck. And I took my mag light, and I pulled myself with my right hand out onto the window seal of that vehicle. And why I did that, I don't know. But I grabbed the blue bubbles that were on top of the vehicle with my left hand, and I had a mitten on. And I reached across with my right hand, and I flashed this object in the same sequence, I guess, that I did back at the LCF with my mag light. Hmm. Blink, 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 blink. I did that a couple of times, and I was, in my mind, I was asking for relief of this pressure, of this, whatever this was, which I can't describe. And then I just slinked down into that seat, and I'm a pretty good-sized fella in really good shape. And I remember putting my weapon between my knees. I just knew I had to secure it for some reason. I don't know why. I don't even know where my flashlight went, but I just dropped my head, and then I was out. And my last thing was I looked at Michael Johnson, and he was frozen looking straight ahead on the steering wheel. He was just looking straight out the front window. I guess I lifted my head up a couple of times, and I seen this black sphere bobbing in front of the truck like a beach ball, maybe a little bit larger than a beach ball, but it had these little vents all over it. It was like it was in layers, like a beach ball with lines on it. And in the middle of those lines, there was nothing there. Not glowing any light. All black. I just remember that bobbing in front of the windshield real fast, real quick. As I dropped my head, I kept sensing or feeling something. Do not fear. Do not fear is what I kept hearing. And I just kind of rotated my head to the right. It was as if I was in tunnel vision. And I see these little beings about 10 feet away from the vehicle coming toward me, and they've got little uniforms on. They had large heads, but not big bulbous heads. They did have large eyes. Behind them was a tall one, and he was more menacing. That's the one I centered on, and I felt fear from that one. What did you see in the tall one? Well, large eyes, just a bigger, meaner rendition of the two that were in front of him by a couple of feet. He was like coming up behind them, He was probably two foot taller than the ones in front of him. 
what would be the height of the small and the large? The tall one, probably five and a half, maybe six foot. And then the ones in front of them were about four, four and a half. And what color uniforms were the small ones in? They were in like a gray uniform. The one on the right, he had a belt. On the one that was on the left, he had this rod in his belt, and it had a tip that looked like a pencil, but it was glowing, and it was glowing yellow. Did he grab it in his hand? I never saw that. But the one behind him, he had something in the center of his chest. It was pulsating that same glow, that same color. And it was the side of your palm in the middle of his chest. It had a glow to it. It got brighter and dimmer. What color on earth would match the color of the glow from the taller being's chest? Cross between uh, orange and white. Tangerine, perhaps. Was it glowing with a whitish light? Yes, with a whitish light. And it wasn't super bright. It was dull, but it was that tint. When I looked at that and I kept hearing, do not fear, do not fear, it was not words I was hearing because the windows were up. It was inside of me. They talked as if it was in water or something coming through me, like I could hear it inside my eardrums without any noise from outside whatsoever. Thought words in your own mind. And what was the tall one wearing? He had on a similar uniform, but it was different. It was belted, and it was more of a darker gray color. It's hard to look at anything else but the eyes. And the face of the tall one was different than the face of the two smaller ones. The face of the tall one was more of a rugged, more threatening type of look. Cheekbones were different, raised higher, jawline was much thinner and protruded differently versus the smaller ones had more rounded features, even though they had larger eyes. And I can't remember the exact lengths of their arms because as they walked, their arms weren't directly at their side. Their hands were in front of them, and they were three-fingered, three fingers and a thumb. Did the taller one have scales like a reptilian? No, did not. And the skin color was not gray. It was kind of a light blue gray. Almost uh, not an aqua, but a teal. And we now have drawings of these teal blue beings. You're showing that this existed back in 1977, even if people weren't saying that they were looking at teal blue beings. Wow, I had no idea. Okay, now, are you aware that you are passing out? What happens inside? It's as if I'm in tunnel vision and I'm allowed to see what I'm seeing because... I remember going completely dark and questioning my mind and everything about my existence, ever. Everything. I mean, it all flashes in front of you, like loss of my father, my mother, just everything that was happening. It all came to me in one flash. Mario, are you saying that you had something like a life review sitting in that military truck with this gigantic UFO and these extraterrestrial biological entities approaching you that you were given through your mind's eye like a movie of a life review? I've never looked at it that way, but yes, that's what it had to be. Really, it just shook me to my core. And it was so fast. I mean, I didn't think I thought I could move that fast. It was just so strange to have this tunnel vision it's as if I was fighting to not close my eyes, but yet somehow being told to close my eyes. And I kept hearing over and over again, do not fear. Do not fear. We are not going to hurt you. Do not fear. Today, in 2021, September, as we are talking do you have any more evolved information or knowledge about why the tall being and the shorter beings would have run through your life in your mind's eye at Ellsworth Air Force Base when they had a huge UFO over a missile site? I really don't know. It was just being either at the right place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right time. It did not end there, and it continued on. What happens? Well, I have memories. I remember somehow or another they got me out of that truck. I was on my back, and I remember lifting up my head three or four feet above the ground as if I was on a stretcher, you know, being moved or something. And I still had no contact, or I had no thoughts of Michael Johnson knowing that he was in that vehicle. 
still staring forward with this blank stare in his eyes. And the next thing that I remember is being in something dark and cold, and it felt like a jello or something. And I felt completely alone. I had no idea where or what was going on. And a feeling of dread came upon me, and, and it really, really, really upset me. As I talked with Mario about his experience and was looking at his sketches that he did in a spiral notebook himself, and his trying to explain that the size of that huge orange fluorescent type sphere covered like something like a super Kmart, it reminded me of a phone call that I received back around 11 p.m. on November 7th of 1975. I remember it almost as if it were yesterday because it was from my brother. I was in Boston. I was doing medical uh, productions for the ABC station there, WCVB. And I was up late that night working at a typewriter on a script that I had to produce the next morning. So when that phone call rang at about 11 o'clock, I grabbed it because I was thinking that maybe it was my family, something had happened was wrong. And what I heard, Linda, Linda, a huge UFO has set down over the missile silo here at Malmstrom Air Force Base. And my brother, without talking hello or anything, just went for uh, a power speech about what had happened, that he had been at a wing party, uh, he's a helicopter pilot, they all have orders when certain things happen like that, uh, sit for. And my brother uh, got his orders and he was to take a high-ranking official in a helicopter immediately to go out near Kilo 7 where the central security was in communication with a sabotage alert team who was telling the central security control that something the size of a football field, 300 feet in diameter, was set down low over Kilo 7, which is, they, they did letter numbers at Malmstrom, and the sabotage alert team didn't know what to do. So jets were scrambled. My brother is getting the person in the helicopter, and this is, he's telling me all of this back in November 7th, 1975. And when the jets got there, whatever you want to say, the UFO anticipating, already knew what was happening, started doing a vertical climb until it dopplered off radar screens at 200,000 feet. And what is really interesting is what happened in the next approximately 48 hours. My brother uh, kept me posted a little bit about things that he was learning. And then when uh, Larry Fawcett did Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, he did a, this book, Clear Intent, that has the Capitol Dome lifting up with a U uh, flying saucer inside. And it says the government cover-up of the UFO experience what does the government know about UFOs and why don't they tell us? And they asked me to submit a story about this with my brother. And so I'm quoting the inclusion of a much larger report that I had done in an interview with Denver Magazine that is in this book. And this is information that I got independently and my brother also targeting teams, along with computer specialists, were brought to the missile site, Kilo 7, to check out the missile, and specifically, they wanted to check the computer in the warhead that targets the missile. Amazingly, when the computer was checked, they found that the tape had mysteriously changed target numbers. One of the jokes was that whatever it had been, it got changed to Washington. The reentry vehicle was then taken from the silo and brought back to the base. And then they changed out that entire missile and put in a brand new one. I think that 
some of the hardest evidentiary material outside of the work I did on animal mutilations has been what has happened on United States Minuteman missile bases where people have seen football field size, Super Kmart sized craft, stop over gates, stop over missile silos, and then there are all kinds of stories about interactions between the UFOs and people stationed at these various places. And this one with Mario, I intend, you, you, you can start sending me feedback if you agree. I think it is so compelling, and he and I did a three-hour interview, that what I would like to do is a part two that goes further into this very strange life review that he had described and other facets. Uh, and so next week, I'm going to continue in a part two. And helping me would be to hear from any of you who may have served in the military, may have been in, let's say, in the Air Force in uh, nuclear missile security. If any of you have any experiences, firsthand knowledge, or know others who have, that you are confident either because it's your own experience or you know these people and their family or colleagues, I would like to see how many more Marios that there are out there that we might be able to learn something more from. And all of this, I hope, would evolve through Bob Salas's uh, press conference at the National Press Club on October 19th. And that uh, people in Washington on the East Coast, if you can make it, do so. And hopefully there will be um, some energy that will keep this inertia going and that Bob's dream to have real congressional hearings where uh, people with various facets, myself included, could actually present evidentiary material in front of a congressional hearing and have it be televised, as hearings usually are, and UFO material is usually not, and this time around, it would be a real step forward, I think, in a lot of ways, if we could have public congressional hearings on the evidentiary, firsthand testimonies, uh, what, what they found inside of missiles, like the one at Kilo 7, all of it officially on the record with a congressional hearing. So with that as a possible goal to go beyond the 180-day countdown, uh, which didn't even say we're not alone in the universe, that things will continue to keep pushing forward. I sure hope so. And Ian, I'd li now like to segue to you to see what kind of comments and questions we have. Linda, that was fascinating. The audience were captivated by your report this evening. They said they I, thought that was really interesting. I hope and so. And it spurred a lot of uh, interest and a lot of people sharing their, their um, experiences as well or, or talking about them. There's even one guy who's just uh, mentioned an experience in Korea, I think in 1969 or 79. I've asked them to uh, contact us, so perhaps okay. we could reinforce that as well. And that was where? In Korea. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So, I'm not sure if he was serving at the time. I've asked in the chat, and we'll see what happens. I'd like to say thank you to all the generous viewers for the super chats this evening, and I'll just go through the list quickly. Thank you. Moonbird, Courtney C., <laughs> J.B. Brownface, Stephen Courier, Joe Smo, Susan Hullig, Tracy S., Eric Ackerley, Stephen Carrier, He's, he's super chatted twice by the looks of it. Brian Lau, Liz Gaspari, William Gal Gallison, Mark T, The Seventh Son, and Jackie Beatty. Beauty, sorry. Oh, thank you, everybody. And for uh, the dear Moonbird and those of you who are there every week, 
I can't thank you enough because an expression of support really helps to do this work, which is actually quite difficult. And uh, I'm so happy that there's so many of you out there who continue to, uh, to help support and sustain and that we've gone through 185,000 and let's keep growing and going because I feel there is a real special communication that is going on between all of you out in the world and me, what I am learning and then being able to report it to all of you. It's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity in so many ways. And I couldn't do it without you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And what questions do we have now? So I also wanted to say, Linda, this is a truly international show tonight. Uh, we've got people in from all over the United States and Canada, but also from um, Denmark, Israel, Serbia, Chile, Argentina, New Zealand, Japan, Brazil, Scotland, Dominican Republic, Australia, Sweden, and Austria, etc. Oh, oh, that's fantastic. You know, that is a great idea. Uh, each week, do a list of all the different countries. That is great. That's what I hope. We, we need to have some kind of neutral place in this world where we can talk facts, facts, real truths. So come to Earth Files YouTube channel and tell everybody you know. And I just appreciate it so much. And I always look forward to your questions. So We've got lots of questions tonight, Linda. All right. Okay, Linda, first question. If ETs and their tech can turn off and on our nuclear weapons, what else could they be capable of doing to our military equipment? Probably anything that they want to, quite seriously. I would say that one of the biggest changes in my own mind and relationship to everything since the first phone calls I started back in 1979 on a strange harvest on animal mutilations and knew nothing and today, I have been exposed to half a dozen people who would be in the category of engineers, physicists, uh, geophysicists, and geneticists, who, as I am here right now in this end of September of 2021, that what I have begun to not just, it's not lip reading or just giving lip service. It's beginning to be a more profound understanding that not only has this planet been left out of the truth that we're not alone in this universe, that the concept of a multi-dimensional cosmos that is infinite and that time Time can be captured, time can be played back, time can be manipulated and controlled. That the Alcubier, I've said it a hundred times this week to make sure I always had it on my tip of my tongue now. The Alcubier warp drive, the ability to move point to point by pulling space time to you and having these two units in which it will have the ability that you could go from, let's say, standing uh, at the center of New York City and uh, walk through uh, just a door that was set up to be a point-to-point -point portal. And you could walk through a door, and as soon as you were through the door, you are at Procyon A or whatever, uh, somewhere else out there. And it used to be science fiction. It was sort of in the category of science fiction. And now today, it, I know it's not science fiction. I know that we have had collaborations with advanced, advanced beings who know how to capture time and play it back, who know how to move point to point through the universe, and that their ability to manipulate anything that we have on Earth is simple because they have control at the atomic and the molecular level. And in me, I don't 
feel fear about that. I feel excitement. I feel real excitement that we are so close to breaking a paradigm that has held this whole planet for thousands of years, that the only intelligent life in this huge, vast universe was here on this planet. When the reverse is, we are the babies, the infants, and we're just beginning now to get maybe to first grade, while there are beings throughout this cosmos that can take an asteroid that might in, and collide with their planet and they can literally move it into another timeline or another dimension. And that that sort of technology has been demonstrated to our own government. So when you think about the disconnect, the real disconnect between what is actually happening with some humans working in collaboration with advanced beings uh, in this part of the Milky Way galaxy and as I understand it also Andromeda and others and that we on the planet have been kept dumb and blind for so long that that is both a political schism and a kind of abuse because we deserve to know everything that made us what our evolution is and what is going on in this universe between the friendlies, the neutrals, and the hostiles. So in terms of all of the advanced physics and the many, many, many firsthand discussions by the scientists that I have had a good fortune to talk to some that uh, I know who they are and I know what they do, that we are at the, I think it's, it's, it's more than a threshold. I think we are already in the revolution. And to me, no matter whether there are hostiles, no matter whether there are threats from asteroids, we live on an unstable planet, but it's been here for 4.6 billion years. And it's about time that we surface life humans be told the truth about the progenitors, about the current conflicts, about what is maybe going to happen, could happen in this century, and the truth about why we're going to launch in two years for a base on Mars in that lava tube with the help of Elon Musk, that there's something that is pushing that to occur. And I think all of you, everyone, everywhere, deserves to know what is going on. And then there's just the sheer wonderful excitement of being able now to go to a computer, as I did this yesterday, and there is Hubble new video with Jupiter. I don't know if any of you do a search, and it is breathtaking. And these are uh, they literally somehow they have done a video as if you were something orbiting Saturn and Jupiter, in this case Jupiter, in real time. And it is profoundly awe. You just, I'm in awe of looking at what I'm watching and realizing that in many ways, even our own scientists are sort of at their own thresholds in our own solar system. And we have so much to learn, and this could be our saving grace if we could just be told the truth and actually become brothers and sisters and colleagues with other advanced beings who already have been here, have been involved with doing these advanced, advanced, advanced technologies, which is neutralizing gravity. That's how they build things, being able, able to move point to point, 
all of it, Ian, coming back to the original question. The advanced physics of the non-humans is uh, incomprehensible to the, the general human population, which then, to me, makes it even more exciting <laughs> because I want to understand it. What do you got next? Okay. Courtney C. says, can she have a uh, question, please, for her birthday? She wonders, have, have you, Linda, ever felt threatened investigating any kind of ET activity by the ETs themselves, like a feeling or words in your mind? Thank you. That's a really interesting question. I have probably been monitored more than I would ever realize. Um, I certainly have been on the brink several times in which I wouldn't have survived if there had not been a voice in my head warning me. Was it my soul? Was it the divine field? Was it an advanced intelligence? All three? I don't know, but If you stepped into my shoes, mind, body, and heart with all of the places that I've been and everything that I have done, I can say this with profound sense of a kind of truth that has come out of living. And that is because I have been saved in many very dangerous situations, because I have had these warnings that have protected me, I personally feel that it is associated with what I call the thought that dwells in the light. It's from the Nag Hammadi. And I think that the concept of the thought that dwells in the light, that is my definition also of the divine field. And the divine field is bigger than all isms. The divine field is not a building. The divine field is when you begin to feel a resonance with something in your mind, your heart, and your soul. And you know that whatever that is, when it happens, it's true. And the more humans could be taught to be sensitive to those kinds of frequencies, to warnings, and not be afraid, but to accept the fact that we are in a universe where frequencies are the key. Dimensions are separated in frequencies, like those black and white notes on a piano. So whatever I did, never knew existed. To my knowledge, I have never had a, de a demonstrable, I am an extraterrestrial and I want to communicate with you, Linda Moulton Howe. I've never had an experience like that. I have been around people who looked human that my gut sense was that there was something quite extraordinary but I could never prove it. What I would hope is that we would get past the, the lies and the policies of denial and that we would finally, as a human species that lives on the surface of the earth, begin to be educated about the beings that live inside the earth and beneath the oceans and in the mountains and throughout our solar system and in so many other solar systems, and that we would be able to be taught by them, that we would go beyond the just humanness on Earth. And maybe once that began to happen and we had by demonstration that the non-humans that are friendly really want us to survive, it, there is something important to them about us. 
how great it would be to learn about the universe by traveling with people who can travel point to point and then be able to come back to the earth and share. And the world would probably move more and more and more away from politics and political divisions that kill us and more toward an appreciation for life itself. I've, I personally feel that whatever the experiment is in this universe, that it's an experimental universe, the key to that experiment is life, the consciousness of life. And we take it for granted. Next, Ian. Okay, then. Uh, what about the nuclear weapons tests that are carried out by North Korea? Well, as uh, as I understand, he that the leader likes to um, likes to um, rattle uh, swords, but it's and, unless something has changed. And if anybody listening has any other data, I'm certainly open to be educated. But it's my understanding that when it comes to actually having an accurate traveling um, missile that would stay on target, they can't do that. So that's my understanding. So this would be in what they did would be in the context of we're here too and we can throw rattles. But that when it comes to sophisticated targeting of an entire nuclear missile going around the world, it's my understanding that they can't do that well. If anybody has op opposite information, tell me. And if I'm right, let us know. But that, Ian, that's my understanding. Would you agree or no? Yeah, that's it. I think that uh, obviously there's a lot of monitoring of, uh, UF of nuclear activity all over the planet and I believe that they are ready to step in where they need to. What else have we got? Okay, Linda, on the animal mutilation topic, uh, can you tell us please what, uh, for the animal mutilations, what is the, e what is the ETs are teleporting or beaming out the organs? As, what is the evidence that the ETs are teleporting or beaming out the organs as opposed to using laser cutters, for yeah. example, similar to Star Trek's transport? Yeah. Uh, there's, I think there's two pieces. One is a beam that would be large that could take a 2,000-pound bull, take it up in the beam into a craft. Okay, that's one technology. Then there is the technology of what happens to the animals. And the cases in which organs are missing from inside of animals and there's no surgery anywhere on the body. Those are the cases that going all the way back to 1979, there were many cases talking with sheriffs and deputies in which it could be the heart was missing from inside the chest when the veterinarian did a necropsy, or it could be uh, that a bladder or esophagus or other organs were also found under a necropsy to be gone. And in my documentary, A Strange Harvest, I went to Rose Medical Center where they were just starting back in 1979 to open up a division that was going to do research to develop laser surgery on humans. And it's in my film, A Strange Harvest, the documentary. And it was, I went to the director of the uh, laser surgery research, explained what I was investigating for a documentary special at the CBS station ask him if it would be possible to get things like chicken or turkey and bring them into a surgery room and have him, the professor and the professional who could use all kinds of electro, electro and scalpel and the experimental laser, and that we would do controlled tests 
uh, the same skin, uh, we would have a challenge of how long would it take to do a laser, electrocautery, a scalpel of a certain circle, two inches by three inches or three inches by four inches on these uh, birds that we would bring into the surgery room. And we did all of that and it's in a strange harvest. And there was not one, there was the laser, the electrocautery, and the scalpel. Of those three, the one that was closest to the photographs that I was sharing with the doctor to say, can we match any of this, was the scalpel. Only on a few, like the excision sometimes in a belly of the removal of a penis and testicles, that would look somewhat like a cut uh, without all of the brown burned edges, not always, but sometimes, as if there were two approaches. And we got into a, an in-depth discussion with uh, the doctor at Rose Medical Center having a whole bunch, I brought him a whole lot of photos to look at. And then I had, in some cases, necropsy reports about the fact that the heart was missing inside of the chest and there was no surgery or whatever. And he said that at the furthest edge of science fiction when he was in medical school was the idea that toward the end of the 21st century, maybe, that they would have molecular extraction surgery, if you want to call them scalpels. It wouldn't be a cutting instrument. It would be literally frequencies applied, you'd have a rheostat and you would, by then, you would know every part, the skin, every organ, every bone, every cartilage, every vessel, you would know exactly how the frequencies ranged in a body and you would make these molecular extraction. Scalpel is just to, to mean uh, to <laughs> excise uh, something from inside the body but you're doing it by molecules, extraction. And all the way back in 1979, he said molecular extractions. That's what I think we will be doing at the end of the next century, the 21st century. Well, that was the first educated down to earth discussion that I had about something really seemingly far out and yet all of these years since 1979 and all of the animal mutilations that I have investigated, worked uh, with uh, vets in the field, doing necropsies, labs, all of it. That taking out or finding upon necropsy is when you come after an animal is dead and you open it up to look for and report cause of death. And it's in that process of opening up the animals that the missing organs have been found. And if that doctor at Rose Medical Center in Denver was correct in 1979, he was basically saying, we're dealing with advanced intelligences that have molecular extraction technology to take anything they want from inside any body if they so choose without any surgery apparent to us on the outside. So that, Ian, is the explanation of what the technology could be that would leave the evidence in the mutilated animals. And on that note, well, we started a little bit late because we had a computer delay, but um, I have really enjoyed being able to share this uh, subject and, uh, the, and hope that you all will let me know if you find uh, Mario's experiences as fascinating as I do. And next week, we'll do a part two on that whole intriguing, why did they do a life review on him? So with that, I love you guys so much. I wish we were on a planet in which every person, every animal, every plant, every single day was in the embrace of the light 
and the thought that lives in that light. That's my prayer for all of you, and I'll see you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white Settings button next to the CC button. Select Subtitle CC and then select Auto Translate. I don't have to put them in select the language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions them. will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been